I am so incredibly honored to have these two heroes of mine and many of yours here with us today, Victoria Gray Adams and Bob Moses. Susan Glisson, who is the director of the Center for Racial Reconciliation and Civic Renewal at the University of Mississippi, will give the introduction presently. Let me just try to set this up in a one minute kind of way. <laughs> the novelist Richard Ford, a Mississippian himself, well, he's, he was born in Jackson, he lives in New Orleans now. Okay, well, <laughs> he's in Montana and Paris more than he's in New Orleans, but uh, he does have a house. He did have a house on Bourbon Street. He just sold it. His wife, Christine, yes, is the city planner for the city of New Orleans. Richard wrote, I think when you have built into your society a completely irreconcilable human conflict, slavery and segregation, for instance, there are schisms and torques and breakage all around you, both about race and not about race, drama, in other words. You know that the civil rights movement was saturated with religious language. You turned to Klan rallies at mass meetings in the mainline churches, all over the byways and highways of the South, God's name was invoked and God's power claimed. Theological drama of a most perplexing sort. And I am pleased today that Bob Moses and Victoria Gray Adams are going to share with us their thoughts, not only about their own journeys and spiritual journeys in the movement, but about this drama itself. Uh, it's afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I had the pleasure of being in Decatur, Mississippi, Tuesday night for a homecoming um, celebration for Medgar Evers. It is his hometown, and it is the first time his hometown has sought to honor his legacy there. Um, and they invited his family back for a very special, what ended up being a two-and-a-half-hour um, service. And Molly Evers was the last speaker. And I was conscious, uh, sitting in the audience, of the person who was introducing Miss Evers Williams. And sort of, doesn't she understand that she's the person standing between who everybody wants to hear from? <laughs> and won't she sit down? Uh, so that's how I feel right now. <laughs> um, many of you know uh, the name Ella Baker. Uh, she said that um, Martin Luther King did not make the movement. The movement made Martin Luther King. Um, of course, that implies that there are a lot of folks who were active in creating that period of time, um, that change in the country. And um, we have two of um, the folks who um, are directly responsible for a lot of the change in my new home state, Mississippi. So I'm pleased to be able to introduce them um, to come acknowledging that I know I stand on your shoulders and continue to be, learnt, be um, advised and taught by you. Victoria Gray Adams' personal motto is life shrinks or expands in direct proportion to the courage with which we live it. In early 1964, she was chosen as one of three national spokespersons along with Fannie Lou Hamer and Annie Devine for the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. As a result of the MFDP, the Democratic State Party began integrating its ranks and the United States national <laughs> landscape was changed forever. After MFDP had finished its most historic work, Victoria Gray Adams lived abroad in Bangkok, Thailand and elsewhere before settling in the state of Virginia. She's the mother of four children and has had a busy career working on community issues and within various organizations. She is the former vice chairperson of the Petersburg Democratic Committee and fifth ward chairperson of the Voter Education Committee. Although she has retired a number of times <laughs> from a variety of areas, Ms. Gray Adams continues to serve, enable, teach, and build local people. Robert P., known as Bob Moses, resides in Cambridge, Massachusetts um, with his wife, Dr. Janet Moses, a pediatrician. They have four children. Mr. Moses was born and raised in Harlem, New York, and received his B.A. from Hamilton College in 1956. In 1957, he received a master's degree in philosophy from Harvard University, and he taught middle school mathematics at the Horace Mann School in New York City from 1958 to 1961. Um, I recall a phrase of 
um, when you saw the students in the first Senate movements in 1960 in Greensboro that you said they looked how you felt. Um, and that uh, feeling impelled you to come south um, where you met Ella Baker and she sent you to Mississippi. Um, during your time there, um, Mr. Moses was a pivotal organizer in the Civil Rights Movement as the field secretary for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee known as SNCC. And he was the director of SNCC's Mississippi Project. He is um, widely credited as the architect of Freedom Summer, 1964, um, effort to bring thousands of students into the state to register black voters, um, a driving force in the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, the result of the, the creation of a parallel institution in that um, effort. Um, and from 69 to 1960, 1976, he worked for the Ministry of Education in Tanzania and East Africa, where he was a teacher and a chairperson for the math department uh, in a school there. He returned to the United States in 1976 to pursue doctoral studies, uh, continue to pursue, pr to pursue doctoral studies at Harvard. He's been a MacArthur Fellow, received numerous awards, uh, but I think the most exciting um, thing I can tell you about right now is that he helped create the Algebra Project, um, which is uh, a project that uses experiential learning. It draws from the work of Dewey, Lewin, I'm gonna, not going to pronounce his name, Piaget, Paget. Thank you. I'm not a mathematician. Uh, and a five circular, oh yeah, it's that French dude that y'all are supposed to not refer to anymore. A uh, five step curricular process. <laughs> that, uh, that by Moses helped to innovate to help middle school uh, students make the conceptual shift from arithmetic to algebra and therefore be prepared to take algebra in the eighth grade and thus a college preparatory math sequence in high school. I know you talk about um, math literacy and science literacy being the new civil rights issue for today. Um, he is in Lanier High School in Jackson, Mississippi um, four days a week um, where he teaches the algebra project. Uh, it is my great honor to introduce the two of you. Thank you. I'm going to do what the Spirit says do. I'm going to do what the Spirit says do. And what the Spirit says do, I'm going to do, oh Lord. I'm going to do what the Spirit says do. I'm going to sing if the Spirit says sing. I'm going to sing if the Spirit says sing. And when the Spirit says sing, I'm going to sing, oh Lord. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing. I'm going to pray if the Spirit says pray. I'm going to pray if the Spirit says pray. And when the Spirit says pray, I'm going to pray, O oh Lord. I'm going to pray if the Spirit says pray. I invite you to join me now. I'm going to march if the Spirit says march. I'm going to march if the Spirit says march. And when the Spirit says march, I'm going to march, O oh Lord. I'm going to march if the Spirit says march. Come on, you can sing. We're going to do what the Spirit says do. We're going to do what the Spirit says do. And what the Spirit says do, we're going to do, oh Lord. 
We're going to do what the Spirit says do. Thank you. Thank you. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do what the Spirit says do. And that kind of sets the tone, if you will, for my journey. Um, I'd like to say good afternoon. And I'd like to say thank you. Where are you, Dr. Marsh? I don't see very well when I'm looking at lots of faces. And I don't see very well, period, anymore. It's <laughs> seeing less good all the time. I want to thank you for the opportunity and the invitation to share portions of my journey with you this afternoon and uh, during the duration of this conference. I want to say thank you to my colleague back here, Dr. Hanna Mabry, who is joining us from Waynesboro. Uh, and has come to give me a little moral support, and I really appreciate that. Um, I, um, what you just shared with me and helped me with referencing the spirit, it's kind of about who I understand myself to be. Um, I think I'm a spiritual person. There are those who perceive of themselves as being humans who are having a spiritual experience, and then there are others of us who perceive ourselves to be spirit having a human experience. And that's kind of the way that I understand myself. I also believe in keeping with that assumption that truly we are spirit people and that life continues. And in the light of that belief, I want to express at this time, acknowledge at this time, the presence of many others who have shared our journey from time to time along the way but who have completed their journey in this particular realm and moved on to the next one. But I believe that once we shed uh, the physical bodies, that the spirit has been set free and that it continues. And I believe that oftentimes at gatherings like this, those spirits are here with us, enjoying, appreciating, and joining us in the celebration of our journey. With that having been said, we're going to do a little ritual now, and it's called uh, libation. How many people in here are familiar with libations? Okay, there are a few of us who are familiar with libations. Whenever there are gatherings like this and I'm invited to participate, I like doing a libation because I like acknowledging and welcoming those who I believe are still with us in spirit. And we do that by using two specific elements. from the soil. Life. Absolutely. And so, when we pour life into life, what do we get? What does it More life. And so, in this particular 
whose name you may want to call out and welcome to this event can be a family member, they can be a public community figure, they can be an historic figure, or they might be a more recent figure. And so I ask you now, those of you who are comfortable with it, to join me in celebrating the libation and acknowledging and welcoming into our midst Thank you again. I really appreciate that. And now we shall uh, continue on. Dr. Marsh, I, I really uh, appreciate the wording of for this segment of the program, the Civil Rights Movement as Theological Drama. I've always thought of the Civil Rights Movement especially the southern arm of the movement as the infleshioned church or the infleshioned spiritual community. But your title adds a bit of class, so from now on I shall have an enhanced. <laughs> Thank you so very much. As I uh, revisit my journey in the civil rights movement, let me just uh, share with you why I do this, why I come oftentimes <laughs> when I really don't feel physically up to it, but when there's an opportunity to do so, 
I come. And one of the reasons that I do this is that in addition to keeping the experience on the front burner of our American society, keeping the experience of the civil rights movement, particularly of the 60s, alive, I also share my story in the hope that I will inspire or that it will inspire, encourage, and lead you to put your faith into action because that is the way I see all this. It's a, it's a walk of faith. And so I don't share with you because I want to hear you say, oh, you were so brave and you had such courage. That's really not what it's all about. I share with you because I, I want you to, to be able to appreciate the fact that you don't have to be uh, uh, specially, you know, situated to begin to be a servant ministry, one who works on behalf of the community in whatever ways that seem needed at any given moment. And Really, another reason why it's not fun to share these experiences is because it's still very painful as we revisit and look back on our lives. But for as long as I breathe and have being, I must continue to do this. I, I dare not, I dare not allow myself to forget and come complacent, nor others. The sacrifices made by those on whose shoulders we stand and the beauty of their spirits. Medgar Evers, Vernon Dana, Viola Luizzo, Cheney, Goodman, Swerner, and countless others whose sacrifices went unnoticed because they were black and unknown beyond their local communities. Consequently, I am before and among you this weekend to share my story and to honor Fannie Lou Hamer, Hazel Palmer, Virgil Robinson, Ella Baker, Annie Devine, my sisters and mentors on the journey, to remind some of you and to introduce to others of you who we were and are and what it was that placed us on the path that sought and leads us to put the goal of obtaining social justice at the center of our lives. So, no you are being invited to join this League of TWC, which I call the League of Those Who Care. I invite you now to come with me to a large rambling farmhouse in Palmer's Crossing, a community of, a, of African uh, Americans who live a few miles, lived a few miles south of Hattiesburg, Mississippi, on a cold winter November morning about 1 a.m., November the 5th, 1926, which time I am told that I made my entry into the human community after a long and arduous night of labor. I'm told that about that time, Mac and Annie Mae Ott Jackson were presented 
with a bouncing baby girl who they named Victoria. I'm also told that Victoria was a very adventurous person almost from the beginning and displayed oftentimes a hazardous curiosity concerning her environment. Being born in the home of my paternal grandparents seemed to have been a very good place for me to spend my formative years. My grandparents were deeply spiritual in their way of being and were a wonderful influence in teaching my brother, first cousin, and me the importance of being productive, dependable, and responsible family and community members. Two vital factors were involved in this process. The need for an independent spirit, and at the same time, interdependent involvement in our environment. Basic in those teachings were love and respect for family, for church, and school. The church was and is, for me, my extended family. The teachings of the church were second only to the teaching of the home. I remember still the mottos that hung on the walls of the one-room facility that was known as, and still is, St. John. St. John in those days, Methodist Episcopal Church, which now has evolved into St. John United Methodist Church. And you know, I am convinced that those those teachings and all of the ways that they were taught impacted my life. I remember the first one I remember was this motto that we had to repeat every Sunday morning. What kind of a church would this church be if every member were just like me? <laughs> and you know, I can remember very well taking that very seriously. What kind of a church would this church be if every member were just like me? And then later they moved that one to the side and they put another one up there that said, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. And, and I, I can remember vividly that I really took those things seriously all of the time all of the time. So what I'm saying is we don't know how, how, at what age children really begin to understand and respond to the many ways of teaching within the community. It isn't only what we say, it's, you know, what kind of decor, what do they see, as well as what do they hear, and how does it impact their lives. I am convinced that all of those things played a very important role in forming the person that I am becoming. I really believe that. Now, I want to fast forward a little bit because I know I only have a time up here to uh, the early 60s. This infant Victoria has become an adult. She's now a wife and mother and businesswoman. Even at that point, I was always taking this, trying to do things that would make a difference. I can remember that when, well, I, during that time, I did quite a bit of travel during this growing up time. And I even lived, as it was pointed out, outside of the country at that time for four years in Europe. But when I came back to the States, I came back to Palmer's Crossing with the idea of developing a business 
I don't know where it is right now. I'm not going to say building a business. Developing, developing a business that would offer opportunities to the people in the community that would enable them to earn decent incomes and make a life for themselves without having to, to perform in demeaning environments and, 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 and demeaning tasks in, in all too many cases. Not that there's anything wrong with any task that needs doing, but there's something wrong when, when you're restricted in what task you can do. So I wanted to offer op to, uh, alternatives. And, and you know, that business was unfolding very well at the time that I'm about to share with you, which kind of earmarks the time that I really got involved in the official movement, civil rights movement. I was doing very well. I had a staff of about 15 people and uh, they were making decent, very decent money for Hattiesburg, Mississippi in the early 60s. And then one day I was sitting here at my desk attending to my own business and two young men walked into my office and introduced themselves as uh, Curtis and Hobbs. and explained to me why they were there. It seems that they had been invited, oh well, SNCC had been invited to send uh, some workers to Hattiesburg, I believe, by Mr. Damer. Well, between the time that Mr. Damer invited them, uh, requested their presence, and the time that they got there, word had come down from some mysterious place that none of the churches were to allow them in. They did not want these people in Hattiesburg. And so here these two young men were here from guess where? Not from the north, not from any college campuses, you know, here, there, from a cone, Mississippi. I refer to them as home missionaries. <laughs> so their plight came to the attention of my brother, who suggested that they come and find me, that I may be able to help. And it just so happened that uh, I thought I could. I called our pastor and told him the predicament of these young people. And he said, absolutely. I, uh, let's say yes. He said, I'm quite sure that the board will not object, but we'll say yes, pending the okay from the official board. And so we did. And I will always remember that first night when uh, Curtis and Hollis made their pitch to the gathered body in Palmer's Crossing, where the Hattiesburg movement was born, at St. John Methodist Church. This one room facility that had all these nice mottos around the wall. After they had explained why they were there, explaining to us how we could do something about the many needs in our community, and finally telling us what that was, it was simply a matter of going down to the courthouse and getting registered to vote. That if we became registered voters, then we would have the means of making needed changes in our community. And I thought that sounded pretty good, and it didn't sound like any really, you know, challenging thing to do. And so when they had talked, you know, told us all the good parts and all the good things and, and what was necessary. Uh, finally, they came to what I call the altar call and said, now, how many people will meet us at the courthouse in the morning? And I thought every, you know, I thought every hand in the house was going to go up. And I, and then I looked around and there were maybe, maybe a half a dozen hands had gone up of which mine was one, and the pastor was one. And I, I, I promise you what I'm about to tell you is true. I heard a voice that said distinctly, Victoria, you're getting into something that's gonna make a big difference in your life. In other words, the message was, 
he may have stepped too far this time. But, you know, my hand was up and my word was out. And among the other three or four people whose hands were up were local school bus drivers. And so we all met down at the courthouse the next morning as promised. Well, by the afternoon when the bus drivers went to pick up their buses to pick up their children, they didn't have a job. And guess what? When the evening paper came out, it was spread it all across the front pages. Local bus drivers fired from their jobs. Why? Because they went down to the courthouse and tried to register to vote. And thus, I repeat, began my journey with the official civil rights movement. Well, my first uh, intention was simply to be supportive of these young men, uh, you know, you know, whatever ways I, uh, they, they needed me to, I'd fix them a meal sometime or, you know, whatever, whatever was necessary. Mr. Damer furnished lodgings, but it was a long ways from Hattiesburg over to Springfield, was it Spring? No, 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 Kelly Settlement, to the Kelly Settlement. So once they got over there in the morning, they were back there, f you know, for a while. And so I, you know, fix a meal or whatever to help them get through. Well. Also, um, I started uh, becoming their interpreter to the community, telling the community who they were because the, the papers were telling all kinds of stories about who they were and why they were there and people were afraid of them. And so that was uh, the ways that I, I tried to support them. But what actually happened there was they would not accept what I was willing to offer. They just kept you know, wanting me to do a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more. And they just kept coming at me until they finally uh, encouraged me, coerced me into going down to um, Georgia, Dorchester, Georgia, and uh, taking the citizenship education training. And so, I, I let them talk me into it. And I went down, took the training, and the, ob the objective was once you took the training, you then come back to your community and you organized your own class. And you taught people the elements of citizenship, what it takes to become a first class citizen. And, you, and, you, and I kind of alluded to this the other day when I responded to someone who was up here that uh, you gave them, you made available to them all of the information that they needed in order to understand what first class citizenship was all about and why it was important for every person to be registered to vote and to exercise that vote. And what you find, of course, is once people get that information, it frees them up when they realize that they're not asking somebody for something that isn't already theirs or should be. And it doesn't remove the fears. I'd like to refer back to the bus, school bus drivers. What do you think happened after that, after that happened? People who may have been willing to go down became very cautious to just flat. No, no. As we began to teach people what this thing, registered voters, what this thing of citizenship education really was all about, then that enabled them to rise above their fear, not to lose it, because believe me, it was no less dangerous, but rise above their fear and begin first, little by little, to go down to the courthouse and try to get registered to vote. Well, to move the story along, I um, kept letting them entice me to do more and more and more. And pretty soon, believe it or not, I actually literally closed my business down <laughs> and entered into 
the civil rights movement full time. And I must have stayed in there on that basis for the next six or seven years. And during that time, I had some of the most exciting experiences of my life. Central to that was the meeting of that young, that, that community of young people called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. In my estimation, the cutting edge of the civil rights movement was the student arm of the movement. They are the ones who enfleshened uh, the social gospel. They came into the communities and they walked and they talked and they worked and they took the risk. They lived in the community and worked with the people. This was my first experience of seeing people literally in my community, they had a saying, putting the money where the mouth was, okay? They actually were willing to go with you. They were willing to be with you. They were willing to take the risk with you, and they did. I remember once, I think we were on the, uh, the march from um, the, um, uh, that last march in Mississippi, the guy who was shot, the Meredith March. We were on the Meredith March, and we were coming down. We was on the last day, and we were on our way coming into Jackson, and we were coming down this, this, this road, and all of the sisters were sitting out under the trees in front of the church uh, between services, and so we were encouraging them to come and join us uh, on this leg of the march. And uh, some of us would leave the march and go up and talk with them. And, uh, so I went up to talk with this group of ladies, and they said, well, we'd love to come, but you know, we got a church service coming up there. So, And I said, sweetheart, that is the church. That's it, marching down the street there. Come on and, <laughs> and join us. And that really is the way that I perceive these young people. I had many, again, wonderful experiences. I have, I have been a part of many, many organizations through the years, very uh, uh, impacting ones, ones that could make a difference. But I have not been a part of any organization or community that made a more, uh, a deeper impact on my own life than it did working with the young people who were known as the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And you know, the things that, that I learned from those young people, uh, I continue, continue to use those very effectively and very successfully. Because here I did see, I repeat, the enfleshing social gospel. I did see um, love, faith in action. And so, as I uh, said a few minutes or two ago, um, I've retired many times, but I've never been so retired that if there was a way to, to serve, that I didn't pick up my tired body, is getting to be my forgetful mind, and try to respond to this because they showed me what it meant to become that which you talk about. And I'd like to back up for just a minute and then I'm gonna sit down. I remember one night at the Morning Star Baptist Church, this was right behind the first Freedom Day in Hattiesburg, and we realized that, uh, well, the, there had come lots of ministers from all over the country to support us on the first Freedom Day that took place, I guess, anywhere in the movement communities. And uh, it was getting time for these people to return to their homes. And I was sitting there thinking, now, 
what are we going to do now that these people are leaving? They, they can't stay. They really must go. And it came to my mind the, the uh, writer of Isaiah when he had been, what was it, uh, purified <laughs> with the fire, his tongue or whatever, and then he heard, uh, you know, it goes something like, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Okay, well, we were at a point right there in, in Hattiesburg where King Uzziah was about to leave us. And yet we knew we could, I knew we had to keep this momentum going. And so I thought of the scripture when he said that he heard a voice and he said, who shall rescind and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me, I'll go. And as I sat there and that thing played out in my head, I, I had to get up and tell the gathered body about it. And, and I said, and this is what we who live in Hattiesburg, we must understand that King Uzziah has died and it's up to us to continue this and die for one I'm saying, here am I, I'll go, send me, and I invite you to do like this. And then a little later, and on another occasion, I remember um, I was on my way to, to a speaking engagement at Reverend Phillips Church in D.C., and I wasn't at all sure what I was going to talk about that morning. And I had my upper room with me. That's a devotional booklet of the Methodist Church was, but now it's, you know. Uh, and there was the scripture where um, Jesus, I started to say stood up, but I believe he sat down among the gathered body and un unrolled the scroll and started to read. And he talked about, you know what he talked about. He come to release To, to minister to, to visit. And then when he had finished that scripture, the really amazing thing was he rolled the scroll up and handed it back. And then he said, today, you have, this, this scripture is fulfilled. And once again, I understood that as an affirmation of what I must do. And so those are some of the things that have guided my life, that have informed my life as I have continued this journey. I invite you, now that you've heard this very brief sharing from my journey, to make your commitment if you haven't already. And I'd like for us to do this together. By, uh, in honor of Fannie Lou Hamer and the very many others who sang this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine this little light of mine I'm gonna let it I let it shine this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Please stand up now and let's put a little more life in it. There must be somebody here that can do this better than me. <laughs> if you can, you're invited to do so. <laughs> this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it, I let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go now, I'm going to let it shine. Everywhere I go now, I'm going to let it shine. Everywhere I go now. 
I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Who gave it to you? God gave it to me now. And I'm gonna let it shine, oh, God gave it to me. And I'm gonna let it, I let it shine, God gave it to me. And I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Thank you. You said it, I didn't. Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and many, many others. <laughs> That's not true. How y'all doing? Um, I should say a little uh, just to pick up some of that story because, you know, Vernon Damer was assassinated in uh, 1966. Um, he had a shootout when they firebombed his, his home. And um, Curtis and Hollis were um, the first two to come forward in Macomb in 1961. And we were all in jail together in the fall of 1961. And then when we got out, uh, there was a meeting in Jackson. And Vernon Damer was head of the NAACP in Hattiesburg, came up uh, to the meeting and asked for some workers to come uh, to his house. So Curtis and Hollis were really the first SNCC workers who um, moved uh, from a particular site to actually start uh, a site of their own. And they were both 18 um, at that time. Um, I'm going to um, do a reading. And I need to thank you uh, for uh, the chance to do this because um, I wouldn't have put it together otherwise. Um, and it gave me a chance, uh, your uh, subject and the way you were approaching it, it gave me a chance to think about um, the movement that I was a part of in a way to do this. And um, I need to talk to you about the reading before I do it. Okay. So. And uh, there's a metaphor in the philosophy of science. It's called the Neurath metaphor. Um, and it was very uh, important uh, in the years between the war uh, when uh, philosophers of science were trying to put together a concept of how to build science. And uh, Neurath uh, said, you can think of the scientific corpus as a boat. And this boat is in the middle of the ocean and it needs to be rebuilt. But there's no place to dock it. And so you have to rebuild it while it's out there in the middle of the ocean. And the metaphor was about the language of science, that the boat is the language of science, and the ocean is the ordinary, everyday language of people. And that the language of science is continually being rebuilt out of the everyday, ordinary language of people. But there's no, there's no special privilege placed that the scientist can go to to sort of dock his boat to get his language in order. And so that struck me as I was dealing 
with your theological language. Because right? it seems to me you got a boat out there in the middle of the ocean and there's this language of everyday people and somehow the language of everyday people has to connect uh, with this theological language. So when I started to think about what to talk about, I decided to make an effort to use the language of the ocean, right? the everyday language of everyday people. And then I got to thinking about, well, how could I make this real? And I decided to focus on three people in the movement, Ella Baker, Amzi Moore, and Fannie Lou Hamer. And to use them uh, to illustrate the three faculties that we all have. And to say how, for me, uh, they took these faculties to a place where God is. So that's the essence of what I'm doing. There are five characters in this little reading, besides Ella and Amzi and um, Fanny Lou. There's Jane. And what I've done with Jane is taken five of her poems and I interspersed them through the stories about Ella and Amzi and Fanny Lou. And Jane is a little like Ophelia in Hamlet or Snick. And her poems um, touch the part of the movement that hurt. And so she isn't in the history yet. We haven't figured out yet a way to tell the history of the movement and also uh, tell Jane's uh, story in it. So I'll try as I read to indicate when I'm reading her poems. And then at the end, I have a poem that my fifth grade teacher taught me, Mrs. Stewart. And we said it at Ella's funeral. And so I'm going to ask you to, if you feel like it at that time, to say it with me. Cotton grows in long rows, in longer rows than anything. And cotton is too heavy for a child to tote, take the children home. Amzi, Fanny Lou. Thinking with our minds, acting from our willpower, feeling through our hearts. Fanny Lou with her heart, Amzi with his mind, Ella with her power of will. These three performers put these three faculties into play at a serious level. 
spiritual, spiritual traditions on all sides, century in and century out, urge us all to put thought, action, and feeling into play at the level where God also plays. This is not easy to do. The Bible tells us so. You know the story. Then there came these two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. You know how the story goes on. And when the king said, divide the living child in two and give half to the one and half to the other, then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O oh my Lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay her. Then all of Israel saw that the wisdom of God was in King Solomon to do judgment. But it was the mother of the living son who put her faculties into serious play. Humility, the virtue of her heart extinguishes her sense of separation and her bowels yearn upon her son. Capacity to surrender, the virtue of her willpower, releases her personal self to the will of the other mother. Wisdom, the virtue of her mind, manifests in her command Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She plays at the level where God also plays. The doors are slamming now, and the little glasses left are smashing on the Freedom House floor. Once more, once more, watch a weeping boy break a wailing wall and crawl away without a hand for anyone to hold. Lie down lie down, cover with the dark. Jesus Christ has cut his throat. There's nothing you can do. And just who is this woman sitting on this bus, singing her way clear? Where is she playing? It was August 31st, 1962, and I was on a school bus leaving Louisville, headed for Indianola, the county seat of Sunflower County. M.Z. Moore had hooked up the bus for this first congregation of Mississippi sharecroppers, domestic workers, and day laborers to travel to the county seat to register to vote. The congregation was mostly middle-aged and older women, and there was one woman who started to sing with the rolling of the bus and who didn't stop until it stopped at the courthouse. The songs came rolling out of her heart, one after the other, back to back, from every country church that ever produced a choir. And every time she started a song, she looked at you as though you knew it, and then sang it to you and through you, since it really didn't matter that she didn't. It was her heart singing in all the minds of all the people riding that bus to the county seat to register to vote for the first time in the life of the Delta. Her heart planting in their minds her songs, one after the other, back to back, flooding out fear, the great mind filler. Where was she playing? Humility virtue of her heart extinguishes her sense of separation and she reaches out with her songs one after the other right there in Atlantic City in August of 1964 just two years later right there at the site of the National Convention to proclaim President Johnson the king of the Democratic Party right there on the boardwalk of Atlantic City, Fannie Lou Hamer. 
The revolutionary element remained intact. They simply stood. She said, no, sir, for emphasis. We didn't come for no two seats, since all of us is tight. Who's that man poking around the post office all day every Saturday? How come I don't see him there nary another day but Saturday? Oh, him, that's just old Ramsey. They got him fixed up on account of he meddles just a little too much into, you know what I'm talking about. Sure enough, sure enough. Well, he sure enough can poke around. See him there every Saturday. Ella Bacon, Jane Stembridge had sent me to Amsey in August of 1960 two years before that bus ride took place. We were looking for movement people from Mississippi to come to the first SNCC run conference for the sit-in movement. When that till boy was murdered in Mississippi in Tallahatchie County in 1954, platoons of reporters established their field headquarters at Amsey's Brick House at 614 Christmas Street in Cleveland, because Amsey knew how to poke around. Cleveland, the only city in Bolivar County, was just 10 miles west of Ruleville. So it wasn't hard for Amsey to hook up that bus that took us all to Indianola in 1962. But it also wasn't hard for Amsey to hook up his brick home for troops of reporters in 1954. Amsey was a marked in the Delta after World War II he had marked himself. But Amzi was the King Solomon of the Delta. There was no wiser person in all the flooded plain of the Mississippi River. But then again, he had a lot of the mother of the living son in him too, fighting as he did for the life of his children. For the cotton is sure enough too heavy for a child to take. Amsey had to grow his wisdom, though, had to accumulate it a little bit at a time. If you hung around him long enough, if you knew how to pay attention, you could accumulate some, too. To Amsey, the delta was like the beach of the river, from Memphis to Yazoo, from Greenville to Greenwood, kind of like a beachhead, all covered over with sugar and sand all mixed up so you couldn't tell them apart from looking. Amsey set about learning how to tell which was which as he poked around the delta in his big old packet like an ant crawling on the beach, separating out each grain of sugar from each grain of sand. You see, he had to pick a path through the delta's unexploded ordinances of slavery in the Civil War. Wisdom, the virtue of his mind, a deluge of wise, small, ant-like, piecewise acts. Amsey looks at me and says, ready? Let's go. This time I am ready, and we go. What I'm learning is not to announce or telegraph my comings or my going. It was Aaron, of course, Aaron Henry. I had been to see Aaron before I went to see Amsey. Passed through Clarksdale and then on to Cleveland. But Amsey saw the sugar. He rounded up some youth and hauled them in his packet to the first Southwide Sit-In Movement SNCC-sponsored conference and told the young people what their energy could do in Mississippi and just how to do it. And thus it was that in August 1962, two years later, I was sitting with that great congregation of sharecroppers on that bus that Amsey hooked up, watching that woman sing her song. We were in Mississippi because we believed we could help the people change their lives. They were starving. We stayed a while, and while we were there, we found out something about love and hate. 
who found out something about being crazy and came up on daisies. These poems were written in the dark just to keep it away or to welcome it, to refuse to be crazy or to go ahead with it, to say something about the lonesome people sleeping around me, something simple about transcendence, about grace, holding hands, daisies, children, food and daisies for every one of the children. Jane Stembridge was the go-to person for that first SNP conference, the one she decided in the end not to go to. She couldn't stomach the decision about bias. Jane was a student at Union Theological Seminary when the sit-ins broke out on February 1st, 1960. Then two months later in April, she drove to Shaw University where Ella was pulling off the movement youth conference of the century, the one that gave birth to SNP. When the conference was over, Jane of the South had agreed to be SNCC's first executive secretary. So there she was, sitting at the SNCC desk in the SCLC office when I arrived in July of 1960 to do volunteer work for King. I had never heard of Ella Baker, but Ella thought that a decision about Bayard should not paralyze the movement, and if the UAW wouldn't fund the conference if Bayard was the keynote, it was okay to move along. Jane couldn't know it then, but the UAW would be back in sync with Bayard after his march on Washington in 1963, and both Bayard and the UAW would be in sync with SNCC and the MFDP at Atlantic City in 1964 when Fannie Lou said, we all is tired. So Ella was probably right on back then in 1960. But though Jane missed Amsey, she did file a field report for him and for that matter, any other movement person interested in field reports. Field report, Mississippi, 1961. Pieces of cotton are caught in the weeds on the edge of the highway from Greenwood to Trevor. I was in the car on the edge of the highway from Greenwood to Greenville when we were caught and dumped like pieces of cotton in the weeds. Jimmy Travis was the driver until he slumped over on me with that piece of a bullet in his neck. Randolph Blackwell was on the other side of me as the car went off the edge of the highway and we plunked down like pieces of cotton caught in the weeds. We had run into some unexploded ordnance from slavery and the Civil War. Their grease guns splayed 13 bullet holes along the side of the car just under the blown out windows. Glass was everywhere, but only Jimmy took a hit. Jimmy boy, don't cry. Please don't cry. I'll play a song for you, a song about the wind, a great wind moving in a high hill grass, a soft wind moving in the south, Jimmy boy. Don't cry. Please don't cry. I'll give my drum to you. My drum. I'm made of wind. A great wind. Moving in a high hill grass. A strong wind. Moving in the south. Jimmy boy, don't cry. Please don't cry. I'll walk along with you. We'll walk to see the wind. The green wind. Playing in the high hill grass clean wind, moving in the streets of the city. Jimmy boy, please, don't cry. A great wind moving in a high hill grass, a strong wind moving in the south, a youth wind to dislodge the tectonic plates that shored the country up in the aftermath of its slavery, its civil war, its reconstruction. To Ella, these young people had the courage where we failed so she, she would work for them. Ella was, as Bernie says, a woman with a voice, and she must be heard. At times, she can be quite difficult. 
she bowed to no man's word. Martin King, Roy Wilkins, James Farmer, Whitney Cannon talked to each other about Ella. Talked to Ella about the youth wing. It didn't matter. Ella created a space in which the energy of the youth wind moving in the South could coalesce and give birth. Hers was a lesson about organizing, true, but hers was also a lesson about power, about willpower and its virtue, the capacity to surrender. Ella was a brilliant role model for this capacity to the youth of SNP. She was always walking the walk at the moment she was talking the talk about this capacity. She had explored its more subtle manifestations. But no matter how large the experiences in which she devoted her personal self, she never failed to distinguish the two. In 1946, I was in the fifth grade at PS90 in Harlem and 148th Street between, at that time, 7th and 8th Avenue. One of my teachers was Mrs. Stewart. She taught us to breathe from our stomachs and to recite a poem about Abu Ben Adam. When Ella passed, a cadre of former SNCC workers gathered around her casket at Abyssinia Baptist Church in Harlem to say goodbye. I remembered that poem that Mrs. Stewart taught me in the fifth grade, and over the years, I had come to recognize Ella as a member of Ben Adam's tribe. The cadre said it with me then, please, if you feel it, say it with me now. Abu Ben Adam. May his tribe increase. Awoke one night from a deep dream of peace and saw within the moonlight of his room an angel writing in a book of gold. What writest thou, Ben Adam said? The vision slowly raised its head, and with one look of sweet accord, answered the names of those that love the Lord. And is mine one? Nay, not so. I pray thee then, put me down as one who loves his fellow men. The angel wrote and vanished. The next night it appeared again with a great awakening light to read the names which love of God had blessed. And lo, Ben Adam's name led all the rest. You can come up with a question after that. <laughs> Feel free. <laughs> Please, sir. Sorry. <laughs> okay. But I do feel in a state of transcendence after listening, having listened to both of our speakers here who spoke from their hearts and from their life experiences. 
And I guess what I sense here is the lever to which I have been moved to. And it says something to me about there is nothing new under the sun. That the past, the present, and the future are so much intertwined in this one that wherever we are in all of this, we know that we are in, as our first speaker said, a spiritual flow, I would call it. And so I just want to express my appreciation because somehow I have been moved to a place that I haven't felt in a good while. So thank you. I, I want to ask both speakers, because I've thought of this uh, a great deal, and um, uh, um, how, how did you live and do live with the sheer unadulterated terrorism that you, you faced? And is there anything that we can learn from your experience that we might share with others after 9-11? But, I mean, you, you as on the front line of that sh face sheer unabated terrorism. And I, I often wondered, how did you, do you cope and did you cope with it then? Well, um, quite frankly, um, as I said a, a bit in terms of just the mere fact of the citizenship education classes and what that did for the people of the community, as I said, the fear didn't disappear, but the, the force, the power of the truth permitted you to make a decision. Are you going to um, be afraid and continue to do nothing and continue to be afraid? Or are you going to do something about what is necessary to remove the source of your fear. And you measure, you know, the difference between continuous living in fear and needing to do something about it when you have the tools and the information and the support to work with. Um, one thing that um, I would like to say, you know, in Kiswahili, culture, there's a concept of the fundi, the person in the community who really is the, the holder of a certain level of the community's knowledge and who passes it on. Um, and so there's a, a way of passing on that knowledge um, so in the context of Mississippi, for me, Amzi Moore, C.C. Bryant, E.W. Steptoe were my fundis. And so I was apprenticed to them. And so I learned how to struggle because uh, they were people who, whose whole life was simply unquestionably uh, given over to the struggle. And the community acknowledged that, and they accepted it. it. It's the issue of surrender. They had surrendered their life uh, to the struggle. And so I learned from them how to do that. And when I say learned, um, it's this process of learning from fundis. Um, it's an informal apprenticing. This is very emotional for me. I was there in the 60s standing beside the march in front of the church 
watching. And I didn't realize, I don't think any of us in the white church realized the enormous importance of the gift we were being given. And that came back to me, listening to these two dear people today. When I grew up, I was socialized to look down on black people. Through the movement of the 60s, I was taught to learn to look at black people as equals. But that's not the end. I've had to learn that real healing means being able to look up to black people. And I thank God I'm able to say, I have come to that point. I just say from the bottom of my heart, thank you. You taught us how to be Christians. In terms of looking at the new civil rights movement or a continuation of the past civil rights movement, I think of the attack on affirmative action, um, the, the growth, the fast growth of the black underclass, um, intense poverty in our inner cities, um, poor education in, 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 our, in our inner cities and in our minority communities. What do you all see as um, things that are part of the new civil rights movement and how can we as Christians and as individuals live out a social gospel aspect of that on a daily basis? Maybe I can respond by sharing with you um, in the light of what is going on in my community now in response to what you've just described as uh, where it is at this particular moment. And, and this, by the way, this grew out of our congregation. We um, decided that we were gonna dream the kind of community that we wanted to live in. And um, so we, through a, an initiative of the, of the United Methodist Church called Shalom, which grew out of the 92, I believe, riots in LA. I think uh, the General Conference was in session. And so they sent a team, the General Conference of the United Methodist Church is, meets every four years and it usually lasts at least two weeks. And so there was time to send a task force out to LA to do some some research to find out what was you know what was really going on out there, and when the task force they came back and reported to the general conference their findings, and so they looked at the fact that this was not just a, a spontaneous something that just thus upped and happened you know but there were causes that had been building over periods of time, the community being exploited, ignored, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, with that in mind, the uh, church then assigned another task force to study this information and decide what can the church do in response to this. And so one of the uh, solutions that was offered was the uh, creation of what became known as the sh creating shalom zones in uh, geographical areas uh, around the country. And so uh, my congregation happened to have been one of the people that applied for a grant because we felt like we had a situation that uh, made us eligible to apply for this grant, and we did. And we were one of 17 congregations universally who got, uh, who uh, was given a grant. And uh, so we uh, created what we call the Petersburg Urban Ministries. And we 
We didn't rush it. And we had trainers to come down from the general c conference uh, and uh, work with us in developing our visions for our community. And that uh, Petersburg Urban Ministries is now probably one of the more effective ministries in the country dealing with inner city uh, young people, in particular the ones who've been left behind. And, and um, we, we are about, we just graduated our third class. Uh, we started out the first time around, I think we graduated uh, uh, 17 out of 30 uh, enrollment. The second time around, 19 out of 40 something. And the third time around, we graduated 31 out of 41 enrollees. And now these young people, when they go through the program, they come out with house building skills. I mean, first class. I'm sure some of you've heard of, uh, um, um, gosh, what is the program? <laughs> anyway, it's a building program, youth build. And uh, they come out with the ability, with carpentry skills. They come out with, if they don't already have it, uh, if they didn't finish high school, they come out with a GED. If they did finish high school, they come. They must enroll in one or more courses in a local or college or university. And we are literally transforming the lives of uh, these young people who are being given a second and sometimes a third chance. And I think it's about, instead of concentrating on the problems, uh, concentrate on what you want your community to look like. And so our vision for our community is to create a shalom, a place of shalom, in cooperation with all the people who live, work, and play in that geographical area. And that is one approach that is working for us in Petersburg, Virginia. Well, my name is Ray Rivera. I grew up also in East Harlem. I grew up on uh, Dick Gregory's book, Nigger. I grew up on Soul on Ice, uh, Man Child in the Promised Land, Down These Mean Streets. Uh, and uh, the whole civil rights movement and, movement and its legacy, uh, are there, uh, w what is your opinion on, I'm trying to get my 17-year-old now, he's my youngest, to read some of these books. Uh, to be very frank, he's not very interested. What is... Uh, the strategy is that if, the, if there is one, to try to transfer some of this drama and rich history into our contemporary youth culture, which are more about Tupac and Biggie and Fat Joe and Eminem. <laughs> 